Hello and welcome to the Divine Renovation Podcast, where we seek to inspire and equip you to bring your parish from maintenance to mission. I'm Dan O'Rourke, and I'm in studio again with two of my friends, uh, Divine Renovation coach and author, Ron Huntley. Good to see you. Good to be here, Dan. And friend of the of the ministry, maybe even <laughs> occasional founder, uh, Father James. It's good to see you, Father James. Good to be back. Then. Now, look, guys, last, uh, last episode, I did something painful and cruel. So for those of you who missed last episode, you must go back and watch it. It was, it was a fabulous episode where we had our, our guest, Daniel M., open up uh, a conversation about identity and becoming a missional church. And so we've, we've, uh, we've uh, twisted Daniel's arm, thrown him <laughs> into a headlock, and dragged him back in for, for a follow-up of that episode because we could not even begin to open up some of the things that he'd written in one of his books called No Silver Bullets. So, Daniel, thank you so much for being with us again. Hey, man. Last week was incredible, so can't wait for what happens right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, we, 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 the question that I gave us last week that we just began to open was, how do we normalize mission in our parishes? And we started talking about the micro shifts that you had written about, and we got through the first two. Uh, the first one was destination to direction, which is that shift of, of uh, proximity to trajectory, right? How do we understand mm. how, how, what, uh, what we're trying to help people form as? Uh, and the second was, it was the shift from out Input to input. Daniel, I'd love if we could start off with, with Micro Shift 3, which is among my favorite micro shifts that you wrote about. And that is the, the, the micro shift of sage to guide. Mm, Help yeah. me understand what you, what you were talking about mm. there. Yeah, so this is all about moving from being the sage on the stage to being a guide on the side. Right. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, before we talk about it from the church context, one thing we just need to backtrack a little bit is how we teach. Right. I know there's a lot of different frameworks around uh, development and and within the church context, the one thing that we do a lot of is teaching. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a lot of venues for this, which also means there's a lot of venues for this talking head. Right. This talking head. So when you think about how we learn and develop, uh, we, we often teach the way that we've been taught. And that paradigm goes all the way to, you know, we parent the way that we've been parented. We we disciple the way that we've been discipled. We lead the way that we've been led. It's it's a lot of, the, unless we consciously do so otherwise, mm. right? So you think about it from that perspective and that we do actually teach the way that we've been taught, how were most of us taught within a school setting, right? So, so in a school setting, your pedagogy is typically uh, – Child, you are a blank slate. Teacher, I have all the knowledge. I am not going to impart all of my knowledge onto you, the blank slate, and you will remember and be formed into however I want you to form, to form you, right? That's often how it works pedagogically. But andragogy is the adult version of learning, and, and it's a whole theory around adult development. And, and what happens with adults is adults have all this knowledge in their heart, right? They have all this knowledge in their mind. Right. So as a teacher, as a priest, as a preacher, what you have to do is you need to figure out how do you access all of this knowledge that they have and, and help them become aware of the knowledge that they have so that you can deconstruct what they believe and then reconstruct it from a gospel perspective. Mm. Right. It has to be that because if you don't, if you just assume that everyone's sitting in your pews, has, you know, they're just like these blank slates that are going to fully believe everything that you say and take it in. It's no one's going to be transformed, yeah. right? You might add something onto this knowledge that they have, but it's not going to be transformational because you haven't deconstructed anything. You haven't ripped it apart. You haven't brought it back and mended it back together. So that's, you know, from a, from a, a learning perspective, that's the whole idea of uh, this idea of moving from sage on the stage to guide on the side. I, I think it's so true because I, I once heard someone say recently, and it was a quote from someone else who said that the challenge of, of learning is not so much accepting and embracing new ideas as it is letting go of old ideas. And that's yeah. certainly the case, not just in making disciples and, you know, in deconstructing a particular worldview and giving them a gospel worldview, but even in the whole task of, of working with church leaders for the sake of renewal and, you know, helping them to let go of ideas around church life that are related to a, a Christendom model of church and embracing the new, the new ideas. We've got, we've got to do both. 
yeah. one of the things too I see Dan does really well in terms of engaging larger audiences. Like he's really good at moving people around, engaging them in discussions, which is a different form of learning than, than like you say, the sage from the stage. And, and even as a coach, as you're talking, Daniel, I'm thinking there's that, that very principle is what I continue to wrestle with because I too think that I, I, sh- I coach the way I've been coached or teach the way I've been taught. And it just challenges me to be more aware of all the amazing things the people we coach know. And I know that intellectually, but it doesn't always change my heart or, the t- or heart or the type of questions I ask or how I engage in a session. And so I just really convicted that that, that principle. Uh, I think I think we can all take that to heart and and just evaluate so, what we're doing. So, Dan, do you've it. talked about the concept. Help make it real mm-hmm. for me. So what are some of the ways that, that we can actually we can we can change the paradigm and, and, and not be a sage on the stage, but approach this in, in a new way? Yeah. So let's let's talk about, you know, the, the universal dilemma that that churches have. Right. This need for individuals to serve and to volunteer. Right. Mm-hmm. And all I mean, the last thing that we want to do is pay every position. Right. That's impossible. I mean, that goes against Ephesians 4 and yeah, you know, all that as well. Right. So um, when you think about this idea of how do we equip our volunteers and how do we mobilize them when it comes to development, uh, we have to think about it from the perspective of onboarding training and ongoing training. Right. So if you have this idea of onboarding training, oftentimes we'll say, OK, thank you for being willing to serve in this capacity right? Come to this class or come to this session where I'm going to teach you how to do this. I'm going to give you a manual. Here's a manual of how to teach a class for kids, or he's, here's a manual for how to serve in this way. And, and we'll often do it that way. But what if we actually move from being a sage on the stage to being a guide on the side where you actually flipped the classroom, right? Where you flip the classroom and where let's say someone has volunteered to say, yes, I want to serve, right? You actually say, okay, instead of coming to a class, where I'm going to teach you everything and you now go and do homework. What if we were actually bringing the class to you? Because everyone, I mean, mostly everyone now has smartphones, right? Everyone knows, um, you know, how to actually, even the fact that we're, you know, this medium of podcasting and, 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 you know, being, having this whole interview on video as well. I mean, what would it look like if the training, the onboarding training or things that we wanted to do was conveyed on video, they could do that at home. And when you came together with them, you actually had more time to process, to, to debrief, to answer questions, to pray for, to care for this volunteer who's giving up of their time to serve instead of having that entire time be a talking head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's that's a, an, an example of how we can leverage this whole idea of, of flipping the classroom and moving from sage on the stage and God on the side. Really Ron, we do similar things with um, what, what we do is we, we have leadership summits. And I think you even write a bit about leadership summits or, or, or something like it. Uh, but isn't that an element of, of what we try and do at our leadership summits, Ron? That's true. We talk about principles that we're all engaged in as it relates to leadership. And then we crack it open relative to what their experience is, which looks this. So they get to share the things that they're doing well. But then they also get to learn from others and things that they're struggling with and doing, which is always way more fun. Mm. Yeah, so that's really cool. I think about that in terms of our new member events. As Daniel, you're speaking, I'm thinking to myself, boy, wouldn't it be cool if they watched a new member event video and then when they came together, we actually facilitated some discussion around it instead of, because we do the Sage from the Stage Mm -hmm. in our new member event. I'm thinking, boy, that's a nice switch. I don't know how Father Simon would feel about that. Mm -hmm. Daniel, you, you you seem to have an opinion on that. Yeah, so I mean, that's a, that's a perfect example, right? That's a perfect example of how you can flip the classroom, right? So the whole idea around flipping the classroom is it's not digitizing discipleship. It's not digitizing development. It's a high tech and a high touch approach, mm-hmm. right? Think about it. And you say for your new member event, you say, okay, hey, if you want to be a member, hey, come out here and and, you know, people can come and connect or, or you're like, hey, you want to do this and go to this link or you email out your members and, and, you, and or email out congregants or, or text if you're doing texting or whatever means that you're doing that. And they're consuming the content on the phone or, or on the computer or on the way. What happens is you don't now get rid of the class or get rid of the event. You now have the event, but it's now a lot more personable. Right. Or it's, an, it's, it's a lot more you don't need to teach as much, but it's maybe you can do interactions or or discussion or have more time for fellowship. But it's this idea of you have you need to have both. 
right? You need to have both. And here's the thing, right? A 30 minute live talk is a 10 minute video, mm. right? Because a 30 minute live talk, you need to, you know, capture people's attentions. You need to tell stories. You need to do all that stuff. When it's video, man, you just take, you know, tell a quick story intro and get right into the content. Because when you're doing video, the reality is most people are going to multitask. So if you spend most of the video telling a story about this side and the other, hey, it's a great story. It'll work in person where it's kind of a socially a faux pas to be texting and such while you're listening to a live person. It, I mean, people obviously still do it, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a faux pas to do that, right? But, um, but if it's a video, most people are multitasking. So if you have fluff, they are, it's, it's even more of a license to multitask. But if you go straight into content and it's principle one and this is this and two, three, and it's like a 10 minute video, people are going to be, you know, they're going to give you 10 minutes. They're going to pay attention to that. And then you, they then, you know, they, you've saved them time because they could do that on their commute to the church or on their way to work. I mean, they can do it anywhere at any time. And then you have the relational side, right? And what happens is when that relational side when you are in a meeting or in a new member event and it is meaningful, right? And it's meaningful not because you got a lot of content, but it's meaningful because you connected with another person mm. or it's meaningful because you shared your story and someone listened. I mean, that is going to be, people are, I mean, time is just going to fly by and people are going to love coming to events like that because they, they, it's, they're active, right? They're participants. They're not passive consumers. Mm. Wow. wow, love it! <laughs> so good. <laughs> well, and a lot of it is is, is um, the kind of stuff we've tried to lean into. We got to lean into in the Divine Renovation Network. So we have we have churches all over the world who are members of the Divine Renovation Network, and in that, mm-hmm. we we have coaching videos both for the leaders, but also Ron, you you as 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 the head of our coaching, you've been leaning into creating coaching videos for for the leaders' teams, stuff mm-hmm. that they can use uh, to to begin to prep uh, for their new ministry roles inside mm-hmm. of parishes. That's true. So a lot of these things are applying and. And at the same time, my head's exploding because there's so many more cool things we could do. <laughs> like this is these are great principles to apply, and they just make so much sense to me. I hope people, our listeners are feeling the same way I am right now. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I love the high tech, high touch uh, phrasing because I think it's just it, it's it's so you, you need both, right? Like, I mean, the, the high touch you can't let go of it. Like, this, this is not a technology solution, mm. uh, and so the, you know, technology mm. can be part of the solution, but but do not let go of it at that point. There there has to be the touch connected. I remember years ago when I worked for the bank the first two weeks they sat me in the back room and I had to watch all these really terrible videos Mm. and there was no interaction it was just no click check the box so that they could say you watched all these videos and then they stuck you in front of a client and I felt like I knew nothing and so it was high tech in one sense but man there was no touch and 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 that would be the opposite of what what Daniel's talking about I I think even of of alpha and it's probably not the best uh, example but if you just think of it as an example for a moment like the alpha videos in and of themselves are, are absolutely insufficient uh, in terms of creating the experience of, of evangelization. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the high touch. It's the community that you're creating right. around at the table, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And so alpha's mm-hmm. orchestrated it in such a way that, you know, parishes can run the video. But mm-hmm. heavens, you got to pay attention to, 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 to the other stuff. Yeah. That's where the magic happens. Yeah. That's why any, yeah. any attempts to evaluate alpha as a tool just by looking at videos is destined to fail because you're only looking yeah. at a small uh, a small portion of, of, of the reality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So Daniel, I, <laughs> I, we, are, we, uh, I love this so much. You have no idea how much fun I'm having. Uh, let's, let's talk about the, the next uh, micro shift, which is from mm-hmm. form to function. Help me understand. Yeah. So when, it, when it comes to belonging and when it comes to community, a lot of times based on church tradition and, and who we're reading and, and who we're connecting with, we're going to think more about the form of community than the function of it. Mm. All right. But the reality is times change, Mm -hmm. seasons change, cultures change, what people expect are changing. And even if you think about right now, what we're going through in the West, this whole idea of this isolation epidemic, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's rampant, right? It's rampant where depression and anxiety. And I mean, these are the, the, the consequences of being so isolated. I mean, it's mental health issues. I mean, it's just going up the roof, right? It's going up the roof because people are, people are isolated, right? The dilemma is we are more connected as a society than ever before. 
right? At least we, we have the feeling of being more connected than ever before because of social media, but we have never before been so isolated, right? Because in a sense, our surface need of knowing what someone else is, you know, what, what, what's happening with them and, and where they're at, the surface need of that is met because we've scrolled through and seen what they're doing on social media, mm -hmm. but the deeper need, the real need, I mean, that's superficial. The deeper need has not been met because you're not actually connecting with them. Right. Mm -hmm. So as a church, how do we create environments where our congregation can connect, be in community and belong to one another. And in order to do that, sometimes we need to move from the particular form that has worked mm -hmm. to the function of, okay, what is Jesus talking about, right? And now what are the new ways that we can then connect people in? So that's where in, the, in, in that chapter, I talk about the four ways sociologically that people connect uh, in the public space, in the social space, in the personal space, and in the intimate space. Mm. Kind of reminds me of what Kerry Newhoff says around method mm -hmm. or mission. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. it that sounds like a similar principle, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. You break it down even more in your book, but I love that. Yeah, we become, we become so attached to the form. Uh, I was reading recently, um, actually, uh, uh, Alan Hirsch actually sent me this, this, this uh, quote from uh, uh, a Catholic theologian called Hans Urs von Balthasar. And he wrote this beautiful thing about the church being a Eucharistic church. Mm. And uh, in the sense that, you know, Jesus took, it was broken and given for the life of the world. And he said that the, the, by its very nature, the church has to be broken and given for the life of the world. And so that means that, and he uses the exact term form. He says, a church that tries to retain its form uh, begins to resist being broken. Because if, mm. we, if we're going to put function or purpose ahead of form, we have to allow, allow the Lord to break us time and time and time again. Because if we cling to the form, we'll, see, we'll, we'll, we'll cease to, to, to function according to our mission. Is I think a brilliant mm. insight. Uh, but we, you know, Jesus used the image of, of, you know, branches being, unfruitful branches being removed and burned and fruitful branches being pruned. And the point is that you, you can't avoid the knife either way. Right. I mean, we can't yeah, avoid the knife, right. but yet we want to. We want to. We want to hold to the form. Mm -hmm. I think part of it too, Daniel. Even when you were saying we teach like we've been taught, we disciple like we've been discipled. This whole there, there just there needs to be an intentionality behind what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Because if we don't, we'll just do what we've always done, and we do that personally, but we'd also do it, yeah. you know, institutionally. And so, I love mm -hmm. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a bit about maturity to, to uh, missionary. Help me understand. That's, that's the final micro shift, the fifth and final. Yeah, yeah. And we talked about this a little bit at the top of, of last week's episode where we were talking about this idea of missionary disciples, right? But let's talk about the Nicene Creed, for example, right? The Nicene Creed is, um, it's, it's a neat creed because unlike the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed is, uh, you know, it's typically expect, it's, it's, it's the most universally accepted Christian creed, right? By both Western and Eastern churches. And, and we have that Nicene Creed, which is, uh, you know, you have these, um, the adjectives, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I remember reading this book by uh, Charles Van Engen, God's Missionary People, where, where he actually changed these adjectives into adverbs. And he said, if we were to change these adjectives of the Nicene Creed into adverbs, this will actually help us move from being a maturity focused church to a missionary focused church, a missional church, mm -hmm. right? So instead of looking at us as being one, right? What, what if we actually change that into being unifying, right? And, 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 you know, holy, we change that into being sanctifying and Catholic, we change that into be reconciling and apostolic, we change that into being proclaiming. Then what ends up happening, cool. instead of saying, this is who we are, it, it moves from that to, hey, this is what we need to now do mm. to live out our identity as the church, mm. right? So moving from maturity to missionary, there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. I mean, we talk about conviction, culture, constructs, and all these different ways, bless, and those acronyms last week. But this is a, it's an interesting paradigm to say, okay, you know, what would it look like if we move from adjectives to adverbs? Mm -hmm. yeah. Love it. <laughs> so, so how would you uh, understand the shift that, that that's possible then? Uh, because 
I mean, we discussed it uh, on, on the last episode, but I, I want to I dive a little deeper in terms of how we can see what might be possible. What are some of the things that we need to do in order to get there? Yeah, I mean, in order to move from being maturity focused to missionary focused, we need to understand that they, they, they work in a cycle, right? And that they are highly related to each other. And it's not an either or, it's a both and. Right. So when we think about how we move from this, yes, we need to move from being, you know, our number one focus in every aspect of our church, you know, being maturity focused. We need to move it then to being, OK, how do we now develop missionaries? Right. How do we now develop individuals in our church? How do we celebrate it where everyone has the same primary mission? right? The same primary mission. And then, uh, because we know that that will actually lead to maturity, mm. right? So even from the perspective of Alpha, right? We talked about Alpha last year at our church, we had over 750 people go through Alpha, right? In, in, in one calendar year. And the reason that that was possible, and I mean, 250 of them were high school students, right? <laughs> Student-led Alpha. Our youth pastor, one of our youth pastors, all he did, he was the pizza guy, <laughs> right so as the pizza guy he would bring boxes of pizza even it's going on right now to each of these high schools in our city and and his student leaders would be leading alpha right 250 students high school students went through this last year because what happens is as we have our primary focus as developing missionaries and as we have our primary focus as saying okay how do we do this how do we encourage this how do we develop this because we know that when they do that maturity is going to result we actually see uh, more movement in our churches than if we were just to say, hey, okay, let's just be maturity focused. And yeah, we need to be missionaries. So let's do all of these apologetic classes, or let's do more teaching, more knowledge, more of this, so that when you have those conversations, you'll know what to say. But you know, when we look at the scriptures, we see, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to give you the words that you need to say right. in those moments. Mm. The biggest thing is we just need to go out, right? We need to go out. I mean, we found time and time again that our best missionary disciples are people who just encountered the Lord the week before. I mean, they're they're, yeah. they're telling everyone, they're inviting everyone. And I think of I think of this the story of Saint Paul. You know, he he you know falls to the ground. He he goes to Straight Street in Damascus. Uh, he gets baptized. Uh, he gets his supper, and then he's out proclaiming Jesus. Now, he wasn't very good at it, and they all tried to kill him. He had to flee for his life. But, you know, the point is not whether you're good at it or not. The point, because it, there's no denying that we need, to grow, we need to grow in maturity. But if you've in- authentically encountered the Lord, you will be missionary r- right at the mm-hmm. beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. completely. So, Daniel, to embrace the missionary nature of the church, uh, mm-hmm. is it sufficient to, to, to cast vision? Uh, develop strategy and equip the church and start moving. Is that is that all we need? Hmm. Well, you know, it's no. <laughs> that's that's a that's a really good question, actually. Um, and I'm and I'm thinking about how how to best answer that because when we think about seminary or when we think about theological development, and we think, okay, what did we learn or or what is most focused on? Uh, what was most focused on? Sometimes. Uh, running a church or leading a church, leading a parish can be so complex, right? There can be so many different things that we can do. And sometimes we have pastors and, and, and priests that'll say, no, I, I you know, I, I know how to do it. I, I, I'm, I'm a systems person. I, I can do all of these things. And then you have others who, who say, no, I, I, I don't know how to do that. All I know how to uh, do is, you know, administer the sacraments and, and preach. And as long as I do that, then everything else is going to be taken care of. And and once again, I don't think it's a an either or approach. I really do believe it is is this both and. And if we if if we can get to this place as leaders, where we truly trust the ministry of the Holy Spirit, mm. right? When 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 we can get to this place where we can truly understand that. God cares more about our church than we ever could. Mm, amen. And God cares more about our city and the lost and the de and the unchurched more than we ever could. And as much as I cry over Edmonton and my heart breaks over this place. And I mean, we recently moved back because God called us to the city, right? And he broke our hearts for Edmonton in a way that I've never experienced before. Right. And if we truly believe in God's sovereignty and his providence over that, Right. And, and, and knowing that God, just as he called me, he has called other people in in our city to 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 that same mission to himself, to draw other peoples to himself. Then if that is true, 
right? And we believe that and we truly believe the scriptures then, right? Then we can say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to make my life and, and the mission of our church to be all about God's mission, not my mission, but God's mission. And his mission from the beginning of time was a missionary of sentness, yes. right? Where God, the father, right? He sent his son, right? And God, the father and God, the son sent the Holy spirit. And right now, God, the father, God, the son, and God, the spirit are now sending, sending the, the church, church to continue the mission, right? To continue the mission. And if that is his commission that he gave us, right? It's not our doing. He gave that to us. And we need to trust that the Holy spirit is going to empower us to move forward. So how do we as churches actually live? Not just, I mean, I don't know how many ch- times I've preached and challenged our church to uh, live, live their lives, you know, live their lives saying, here I am, Lord, send me right here. I am Lord, send me. Yeah, what if me. as leaders, we said here, Lord, here's our church, use us, send us. And we had that trust in our father. You think it in the, on Easter Sunday, Jesus said, "Receive the Holy Spirit as the Father sent me." Mm-hmm. So I send you. So, so yeah. receiving the Holy Spirit is intimately and intrinsically linked to living out mm-hmm. the mission of Jesus Christ Himself, which which was handed on to us. Uh, the Holy Spirit's yeah. not just given it to us so we can have warm fuzzies mm-hmm. if we want mm-hmm. once in a while. Here's what I, here's what I love about everything we've been talking about today, Daniel, and and for listeners uh, who've, who've been joining us who are familiar with divine renovation, many will be familiar with the the three keys, which is our logo, uh, and and so I, I you know I I, I I queued you up there. I was curious to see how you'd answer because I, I deliberately staged the absence of one of our keys because I said you know like it's we, our three keys, Daniel, are the the primacy of evangelization, the best of leadership, and finally the power of the Holy Spirit. And oh. and so I left out the power of the Holy Spirit just to see where you drive it. And where did you go? You went right into the Holy Spirit because it's yeah. it's those three essential things that 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 uh, that are so key to making sure we've got that missionary posture. And so yeah. I, I just I love that the synergy between what divine renovation does and what you what you write about and the way you think. We're so bad at math in the church, <laughs> right? Because I think we forget that twenty two comes after twenty one, and sometimes. <laughs> We, we think that John 20 ends it at verse 21, right? And, and, and we see it as, as the Father sent me, so now I sent you. Oh, as the Father sent me, so now I sent you. Okay, we are sent, guys. We need to do this. We need to do that. But we forget that there's a verse 22, right? And a verse 22 says, receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and there's no way, there's no way that we can be sent. There's no way that we can live on mission as a church without the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? Just imagine what the church would be like without the Holy Spirit, yeah. without that verse 22. You're, you're, you're diagnosing the, the core problem. You know, we've, we've reduced Christianity to God with us when it's the point of God with us was so that God could be in us. Mm-hmm. And, wow. you know, in terms when it comes to mission, Jesus says, stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And yet, you know, um, it, it's that experience of power that drives us towards mission. But without it, we become missionless, uh, mm-hmm. directionless. And there's no longer a cultural force that, that is pushing us into church because it's perceived as a good thing. And the experience subjectively for a lot of people isn't that great. So a lot of people just have concluded this is irrelevant to my life. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do that horrible thing for us, guys. <laughs> I'm going to say we ran over time again. <laughs> and so, so, Daniel, is there any, I want to give you a space to, to say any sort of parting words on this episode because, holy smokes, man, I, I just, I wish we could have you on every week. You're just so much fun. Uh, so, so please, if there's anything else you wanted to pass on, we've got listeners all over the world. Uh, any comments or thoughts for, for priests, bishops, lay leaders, pastors? Yeah, yeah. I, man, my heart I love what Mel Denia said, right? In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, uh, freedom. In all things, charity. Mm-hmm. Right. And and when you think about that, obviously, everyone's gonna have a different opinion on what essentials mean, right? And what unity means. Uh, but when we look at John, right? When we look at the Book of John, and when we look at what God um, is calling the church to, right? It's it's unity, right? And and it's unity from this perspective of. The world, when the world looks at the church, mm. the world sees brokenness uh, in the church, right? The world sees disunity in the church. The world sees fighting in the church. And my heart, right? My heart is that in every single city, 
uh, around this world, <clears throat> that we see all churches working together, right? We see all churches working together toward this common mission of seeing the churches reach, uh, to seeing our cities reach, to seeing the de church and the unchurched discover Christ. Mm -hmm. And we, and, and it's not just one tradition that can do that. We need all types of traditions and different sizes of churches and Catholic churches and Protestant churches and, and mainline and evangelical. We need these churches if the churches are saying, hey, we are willing to be led by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have our theology. We have our way of doing things. But if all of us will actually submit that and say that is all secondary, tradition is secondary to primarily submitting our lives to Christ and, and that, that sometimes means disruption, that sometimes means innovation, that sometimes means working together with someone that you might actually experience flack from, from, from your peers from. But if, but if primarily it means, hey, we are going to see this community and this neighborhood reached for the gospel, and maybe you're going to reach them, but they're going to be discipled in another church. How can we get to the point where we'll celebrate that, mm -hmm. right? Instead of saying, hey, I have lost. No, what if we actually say, hey, if, if, and here's what statistics will show, right? If someone grew up Catholic, Catholic church and left the church, Catholic churches probably have the greatest opportunity to reach them because if they're going to be rediscovering faith, they're more likely to visit a Catholic church than a Protestant church because that is what's familiar to them. Right. Mm -hmm. So what would it look like if we were to actually partner with each other as churches instead of demonizing the other? Right. We were to partner with each other and say, hey, let's work together for the primacy of the gospel to see all nations. Right. Every tongue, tribe, people and person come to know Jesus and worship him as Lord. Mm. Amen. There's that, a vision I'll get on board for. That, that was the first reading this morning at Mass. Yeah. <laughs> You're right on. Daniel yeah. M., author of You Are What You Do and Six Other Lies About Work, Life, and Love and No Silver Bullets and a podcaster with his wife on In Between and also the New Church's Q&A podcast. Daniel, it has been such a pleasure to be able to spend time with you on this episode, on the previous episode. Thank you so much for being with us. And for those of you who joined us, I, I encourage you to check out Daniel M. and his website at danielm.com. Uh, hunt down his books. It's well worth your time. And do follow him on his podcast. He's, he's, uh, he's doing amazing things. And as you've been able to experience in our brief conversation, he's got lots worth sharing. So thank you for being with us. And God bless. Thanks so much for listening. If you're excited for more content, check out Unlocking Your Parish, Making Disciples and Raising Up Leaders Through Alpha by Ron Hunley and Father James Mallon. For more information on all of our books, check out the link in the description below. Next week on the podcast. Do we know who we are and why we exist? That's really going to dictate how we spend our time and energy. But once we reawaken to our primary identity, it's like, wait a minute. Well, if that's really what I'm called to, then if I look at my behaviors, my timetable, and how I spend my money, <clears throat> this isn't good enough anymore. And that's a great place to awaken to. 